Hello, everyone, and welcome to phyloseminar.org. The current theme is transmission tra trees, and this is the third talk in a series of three talks on that topic. Please use the YouTube live comment box to ask questions or tweet at phyloseminar. Today's speaker is Eben Kana. Bible analysis, epidemiologic methods, phylogenetics, and causal inference. He did his doctorate in epidemiology with a master's in biostatistics at the Harvard School of Public Health, working with Mark Lipsitch, followed by a postdoc at the University of Washington. A faculty position at the University of Florida, where he rose in the ranks and then moved to Ohio State University, where he is now associate professor. Welcome, Eben, and thanks for speaking us to us today. All right. Well, thank you for uh, for having me. I'm I'm it. You know, I'm I'm surprised to be following. Um, you know, the, the the last two speakers because they're uh, they know much more about this topic than than I do. I'm I'm a bit of a a neophyte, but um, hopefully hopefully I I live up to what Carolyn promised. So uh, let let's see. Should I just go ahead? Yep, go for it. Okay. So so I I want to talk about. Um, what phylogenetics can and, and cannot do in, in infectious disease epidemiology. I, I think the, um, the enthusiasm for, for genetics is, is good, but it's, it's reinforced some particularly bad habits that already exist in infectious disease epidemiology, the most important of which is to ignore data on people who were at risk of infection but not, not infected. Um, the, in the current uh, COVID-19 outbreak, uh, we have a lot of data, like line lists of infected people or epidemic curves, but there's there's very very little data that includes people who are at risk of infection, but but not in not infected or or any sort of denominator. So I I, I think the genetics genetics has has in some ways reinforced that. And but to to have um, you know phylogenetics live up to its potential. In infectious disease epidemiology, I, I think we need to uh, to to break that habit. It, it needs to be supported by good epidemiologic study design and, and good likelihood. So here's an example from um, a PLOS computational biology paper I did with Tom Britton, uh, Betts Halloran, and Ira Longini, where we we looked at how you know a phylogenetics by par by contributing partial information about who infected whom could make estimation more efficient. So the the circles are are the uh, relative efficiency of, of an analysis using only epidemiologic data on person, place, and time. Uh, 1.0, that's, that's the phylogenetic estimates. And then below them, we have the um, epidemiologic data plus exact knowledge of, of who infected whom. So we, we can see that the phylogenetics are, are about halfway or, or more than halfway from knowing nothing about who infected whom to knowing everything about who infected whom. So th that's very useful. But it's still very important to use um, good study design and a good uh, transmission likelihood. So up at the top, we have the statistical performance of estimators with exponential contact intervals. We'll talk about contact intervals later. So relative efficiency, we have one is epidemiologic data only. If we add the phylogeny, we get 1.39. If we know exactly who infected whom, we get 1.75. So there you see the increasing efficiency that we saw on the last slide. If I remove data about who you know? Who people who were at risk of infection but not infected? Um, the the picture deteriorates dramatically, and we have relative efficiencies of 0 0.29, 0 0.48, and 0 0.67. So, by not having that data, we dig a hole that we can't get ourselves out of with with anything that we could do with the the phylogeny. Sorry, I think. Uh, can I just interrupt you for a sec? Sure. Uh, this, the the slides are sort of vibrating in a weird way. Let's just turn off the screen sharing for a sec and then bring it back. Um, sure. I don't know exactly what's going on, but um, are they vibrating now? Stopped now. Okay. Well, I'll just pester you again. Okay. Uh, yeah. If it starts again, let me know, and uh, we'll. Yeah, it looks good now. Okay. Well. Okay. Uh, I'm happy. Um. Let's see. So right. Does it, does it vibrate when I move the mouse around? Is that the problem? No, it looks totally fine now. Yeah, um, I think a notification came through, so maybe that caused the slide to vibrate. Well, anyway, so you were okay. making a super important point. <laughs> so let's okay. just so be, let's just repeat that point before I uh, right. So so when we um, when we do the same 
you know, when we when we do the same project, but we use data only on infected people, we we get um, you know much larger mean squared errors. We get much lower coverage probabilities, and we get much lower uh, relative efficiency. So the the phylogeny can't dig us out of the hole that we dug for ourselves by using data on infected only. The other thing is that many of the important questions in infectious disease epidemiology are about the effects of covariates on infectiousness and susceptibility. And I would add to that also that the timing of infectiousness relative to the onset of symptoms and, and things like that. And to properly answer those questions, we need denominators in our data. So uh, we actually have our first question that is from Carolyn, who says she isn't having a problem with vibrating, but she go back to the previous slide, please. Sure. So she's wondering what efficiency means in this case. Oh, so this this would be um, this would be like means means. It's the uh, mean squared error divided by mean squared error. So, so with and with. So so with the um, with epidemiologic data with the epidemiologic data only, um, you know that that we just arbitrarily set to one. The uh, the you can think of it. The variance is. 40% lower with a phylogeny and 75% lower when we know exactly who infected whom. So it's efficiency in terms of variance estimation. It's like the, the classic statistical definition of, of relative efficiency. Okay, thanks. In, in asymptotic statistics. So, um, yeah, so, so and the, the main idea is, is like the, the variance of our estimators is getting smaller as, as we know more about who infected whom. The phylogeny gets us uh, a lot of the way to knowing exactly who infected whom. But once we throw away data on the people, on the denominators, uh, we, we're, we're in a lot of trouble. You know, the, these are not coverage probabilities or relative efficiencies that we would like to see. Um, so we also, so epidemiologic study design matters. So this is, this is a simulation study from a paper I did with Yusuf Shorkar. Um, on a, a pairwise accelerated failure time model for infectious disease transmission. And we can see, so we have two study designs that are valid. So this is where we have sort of complete cohort data. And here's where we, we um, left truncate the households in which index cases are identified. So we, we don't, we, we observe the household after we identify an index case, but we don't pretend that we were watching them from the be beginning of time. And then uh, we have uh, households with no delayed entry. So there we find a household, but then we pretend we're watching them from time zero. And then we ignore external infection. So we assume that once an index case occurs, only transmission within the household matters. And you can see with, um, with in the valid study designs, we, we get, you know, we don't get a lot of bias in the estimators. We get slightly more, the gray circles are when we do not see who infected whom, and the black circles are when we do. So you can see the variance in increases slightly as, as we expect. But when we ignore external infection, when we see who infected whom, it actually, it's surprising how well these designs can work for certain parameters, but not for all parameters. But you can see when we don't see who infected whom, or when we have partial information about who infected whom, we can get substantial, substantial bias. And these, these are intercept terms. So complete cohort data, we get it in both times with the delayed entry, we get it both times. When in the invalid study designs, we actually, I, and I was shocked to see that there was very little bias when we had bad epidemiologic study designs. But when we when we don't see who infected whom, then we really are depending more on, on the study design. So uh, epidemiologic study design matters, and, and that, that includes you know, having data on people who were at risk of infection but not infected. So, so specifically... That's what you mean by bad epidemiologic study design is that there's sort of lacking information. On right. That. So th there's there's many ways to do bad epidemiologic study design. And one one is to have uh, only data on people who have the event. That's called right truncated data. So that's, you know, I, I think of that as the room 237 of survival analysis. You just don't don't go in there. You know, you, you it's very difficult to do anything valid with right truncated data. But we try to use right truncated data all the time. In infectious disease epidemiology, including the COVID nineteen outbreak and H one N one and sorry, and you you go back. Uh, it's more common than not to use right truncated data. So that that would be excluding the people who are at risk of infection but not infected. 
Um, the, the bad study design here is, is we ignore the possibility of external infection. So this would be the sort of thing that we're doing if we use a binomial model to look at household secondary attack rates, where you, you essentially assume that the once an index case occurs, the people in the household are no longer at risk from other sources. The other thing that goes on there is people assume that you only need to take account of one generation of transmission and that the process is essentially binomial, which it is not. Um, and then no, no delayed entry, and that would be, I'm, I'm adding in person time where there was guaranteed to be no event. So I still have people who were at risk of infection but not infected, but I'm, I'm including person time in which they were in some sense guaranteed to not have an event. And it, it's like, um, you know, somebody, somebody shows up, you know, there's, there's some sort of event, and I'm, I'm studying um, mortality after that event, and somebody shows up five years into the study, and then I the proper thing to do is to left truncate them. So I, I, I exclude the person time before they showed up in the study. But if I don't left truncate at them, I, I pretend that I saw them from the beginning of the study. But then I'm adding in people, I have the potential to add in people who did not have events, but people who did die before they showed up into the study are not included. So that, that biases the estimates of risk downward. So there are all kinds of different ways to screw up the epidemiologic study design, the most common one in infectious disease epidemiology is to use right truncated data where everybody has been infected. So, so the, but the, the point is that the, um, you know, seeing who infected whom, it, it reduces variance. It can also help us avoid bias with, with bad epidemiologic study design, but both of these things are important because we'll only have partial information about who infected whom, not complete information about who infected whom. And if in, in the paper, in the, with the bad study design, we do get bad coverage of co confidence interval coverage probabilities and things like that. So this is giving a very rosy picture of what we get with bad study design. But it, 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 it is important to note that we're not only getting higher precision, but we can also avoid bias with, with phylogenetics. So um, Carolyn actually had one more question, which is she sure. just wanted to double check. The, the part where we get the phylogenetic information in that previous slide, that's that's where we sort of get partial information about the contact information. Uh, maybe that, not the following one. That's right. So that's that's um, and then you know in the the in the work I've done, that's the main that's the main reason to be interested in the phylogeny is to get partial information about who infected whom. So and there, and there are other applications of, of phylogenetics and, and epidemiology, but we're we're thinking of a, a sort of small scale transmission. Densely, you know, so there's the large scale sparse yeah. sample setting, which is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the um, dense sampled small scale setting. Yeah, so, I, we'll, I, I I look forward to hearing a little bit more about how exactly what you mean by partial information. I, I could imagine that either being like a Bayesian posterior or uh, some sort of like exclusion inclusion sort of thing. It's um yeah it's it turns out it was a lot more complicated than I thought it was going to be when I went into it. All right, um, I'll let you the, get on your talk. But the phylogenetics are, are you know, the you know, phylogenetics are an extremely important source of information for an infectious disease epidemiology, and uh, both for precision and for bias. So uh, another thing that's important that, that sometimes gets ignored is, is it's important to have an, an underlying model of transmission that's essentially valid. So this is a simulation study from, from a while back where we had likelihoods that were good for um, network-based models, and then we had likelihoods that were good for mass action models. And this, this was sort of... Um, yeah, there had been H1N1 and things like that going on. I'd, I'd worked on the epidemic curve from Mexico City and estimating R0, and I thought, you know, these people are probably really living on some sort of, you know, con you know social contact network in some way. But when when we get these R0 estimates from the epidemic curve, we're, we're essentially assuming mass action. So I just, I wanted to see what would happen if I took this data generated on the network, then threw away everything that I knew about the network, and analyzed it like a mass action model, and, and the results were shockingly bad. So 95% confidence interval coverage probabilities for R0 and uh, the, the you know, underlying rate of transmission were 0.185 and 0 0.004. Um, so the coverage probabilities when when I was assuming a network and I, I had you know I had data on you know who is neighbors with whom, I got coverage interval, you know coverage probabilities that were around the, the nominal level, but 
but when I assumed a mass action estimate, I was getting estimates that were much too high. So, you know, we the, uh, epi the, the likelihood matters, the epidemiologic study design matters, and the underlying transmission model matters. These, these things all remain important even when we have, um, you know, partial information on who infected whom. I, and I just, just to clarify, I mean, the mass action isn't something that I think most phylogenetics folks are familiar with, and I definitely have not. So oh, this, sure. So that, that, would, that, would be, that would be, these are the very, the very classical sort of compartmental epidemic models where, where they say, you know, people interact like gas molecules. So, um, and there's a very interesting transition from network-based epidemic models to, to mass action epidemic models. But it, it essentially means that each time I make an infectious contact, it's with a new person, not, not with um, somebody I'm I'm attached to by an edge. So cool. thank. You. Okay, so the first thing I if, the next thing I want to talk about is um, is this idea of a contact interval. And we'll start with uh, generation and serial intervals. And and just to fix um, terminology, we have you know people move from S to E to I to R, and that's not because we're working with a compartmental epidemic model. These are just four, you know the four states that people go through. And then we, oh my gosh. Uh, okay, so then we have the infection time for person I is TI. They have a latent period, epsilon I, which is just, I chose that to match E. And then we have iota I is the infectious period. So then we have S to E at TI, E to I at TI plus epsilon I, and I to R at TI plus epsilon I plus iota I. So the, the incubation period is the time between infection and the onset of symptoms. So here we have I gets infected and, and then I has in symptoms and then J gets infected and J has symptoms. And clearly this would depend on how we defend, you know, define symptoms and define a case. And we've seen in the current epidemic how the case definition um, can, can seem to dramatically alter the epidemiology of the disease. So here we have the generation intervals, the time between infections. We usually don't observe the infection time. So, so the generation interval is often replaced by the serial interval, which is the time between the, the symptom onset times. And Tom Britton and Giampaolo Scaliatomba recently published a very nice paper about all the things that co can go wrong when you, you do things like this. So um, yeah, that that's that's worth looking at. But I, I'm going to assume that we can somehow get to the, the generation intervals so to give us the best possible case. So generation intervals are often used in uh, a, a branching process approximation to the initial spread of disease, but there's some fundamental problems with this. So in, in the branching process, you know, you create a population of infected people in, in the same sense that a population would grow. So we'd have, you know, a number of offspring and then age at which offspring, you know, a, an animal produces offspring. But what an ep is happening in, in most epidemics is that the population is spreading through an, an existing population and there, there are susceptible people and the time those people spend at risk of infection but not infected is informing us about transmission. So in order to, um, another a byproduct of this is that if you actually do a stochastic epidemic model and you track the generation intervals, they, they, tend, they tend to contract and sometimes they'll, they'll get longer again and sometimes they won't. So, there's, there's this phenomenon of, of generation interval contraction. So some people have worked on, you know, how do we account for generation interval contraction when we do these likelihoods based on generation intervals? But I, I think there's a, a, a more uh, practical approach to this and a more stable approach to this problem. So I, I, I call these things contact intervals. So an infectious contact from I to J is a contact sufficient to affect J if I is infectious and J is susceptible. The contact interval from I to J is the time between the onset of infectiousness in I and the first infectious contact from I to J, whether or not that infects J. So the idea is very similar to that of the generation interval. It, it just, I don't condition on the transmission of infection which makes a lot of the problems with, with generation interval contraction go away. And these intervals are defined in all pairs where there's a risk of transmission from I to J, not just the pairs where I infected J. So the contact interval tells us a lot that's, that's useful to know about the infectious disease. So we, we can calculate probabilities of infectious contact as a function of infectious age. So the, I, I, the infectious age is the, the time since 
the onset of infectiousness. So the, the overall probability of infectious contact from I to J is one minus SIJ iota, where this is the infectious period of I. So if I and J are members of a household, we would call that the secondary uh, household secondary attack rate. These attack rates can also be defined in other populations at risk of infection, such as house, you know, hospitals or schools or cruise ships. Uh, the infectious period distribution is often unknown, so it's common use to use a, a fixed iota that's thought to cover the entire period of infectiousness. So the other thing is um, the hazard function of the contact interval distribution tells us about instantaneous infectiousness, which is sometimes called the, the infectiousness profile. So the, um, the, you know, the probability that J receives infectious contact from I in a small time interval is proportional to the hazard function times the, the width of the, the time interval. When that width, this is a limit, so we're assuming that the time interval is very small. So we, we get both, um, your know, transmission probabilities and infectiousness profiles out of the contact interval distribution. And th they're actually, you know, contact interval distributions are, you know, if you look at any stochastic epidemic model, you can find a, a contact interval distribution, but not necessarily, you know, so these, the models that we actually use are, are specified in terms of contact interval distributions and not generation interval distributions. So, a network-based epidemic model has to specify the hazard of infectious contact across an edge during an infectious interval, individual and a susceptible neighbor as a function of the time since the onset of infectiousness in, in the infectious individual. So in a lot of models, that's just, you know, we assume a constant hazard of infectious contact, so, it's, so these things are exponential. Uh, and then in an unclustered configuration model network, you, you know, from the, given the, the survival function of the contact interval distribution and the infectious period, we could, we could get R0. Now notice here, R0 is governed by the degree distribution and the survival function of the, the contact interval distribution. A very interesting ha thing happens when we move to mass action models. These are where I'm not connected to other people. I'm floating around like a gas molecule, inter, you know, running into other people and possibly making infectious contact with them. So the hazard of infectious contact is, is inversely proportional to the population size. When n is large, the expected number of infectious contacts made by an infectious person I in this small interval of time is the hazard of the, con the, the contact interval hazard function divided by n minus one integrated from zero to tau. And then, so this, this is starting from the onset of infectiousness in I. So it's Ti to Ti plus tau. So we have an integral to tau, but then that's multiplied by n minus one because this applies to all of the other people in the population. So we end up with a number of infectious contacts that's governed by the cumulative hazard function of the contact interval distribution. So the basic reproductive number now is, is determined by the infectious period and the cumulative hazard function instead of the survival function. So Kermick McKendrick model has exponential beta contact intervals and an exponential gamma infectious periods. So we get beta over gamma. So the, the cumulative hazard is, is beta times tau, and then the expectation of tau is one over gamma. So we get beta over gamma. So contact intervals are actually embedded deeply into stochastic epidemic models, both network-based models and mass action models and models that have multiple layers of, of transmission. So now I want to look at how we use the contact intervals to write likelihoods. So we have transmission in a household of size three. We have A, B, and C are infected at times T, A, T, B, and T, C. We don't have a latent period just for simplicity. And, and here's how things work. So, you know, here's the inf infection and recovery time of A. So A was infectious well when I got infected, when B got infected, and we're going to assume no infection from outside the household, even though I've complained about that. Um, but this is for simplicity. So, B, you know, A is the only possible infector of B. And then when C gets infected, A and B are both infectious. So they're both possible infectors of, of C. So if we treat the spread of infection as a branching process, we write a likelihood in terms of the generation interval distribution PDF. So here we let, you know, G tau is the PDF of the generation interval and uh, just for notation, well, GIJ is the, the this PDF evaluated at the infection time of J minus the infection time of I. Uh, 
So if we treat it as a pairwise survival process, we could write the likelihood in terms of contact interval hazard and survival functions. So we will call those H of tau and S of tau. We'll let Hij be the hazard function evaluated at Tj minus Ti, and Sij be the survival function and evaluated at that same time. So there are two possible transmission trees. We have A infecting both people over here. We have A infects B and then B infects C. So here we have the likelihood is GAB and GAC. And here we have GAB and GBC. The overall likelihood would be the sum of those of the likely contributions of the possible transmission trees. With a pairwise survival likelihood, we have something that, that's similar. We have um, HAB times SAB, which is just the, the contact interval probability density function at, from A to B. And then we have HAC times SAC. But we also have this term S of BC. So we have PDS for, for the time from A to B and the time from A to C, but then a survival term to account for the, the time that C spent at risk of infection from B, but not being infected. And we get something similar over here, except now we have uh, PDS for A to B and B to C. And then we have the survival function for A to C. So the survival functions are, are always the same. So it doesn't, the, the transmission tree does not affect the survival terms, but it does affect the hazard terms. Here we have HAB, HAC. Here we have HAB and HBC. The overall likelihood is this. And th this term is very much like the generation interval PDFs, but we can't write this likelihood without the survival functions. So now if we look at source attributions for transmission trees, this, this is an important thing. Now, if, if everybody has this, you know, if everybody's the same and they have a constant hazard of infectious contact, both of those transmission trees have to be equally likely. If we look at source attribution in the, uh, in the branching process likelihood, we get a, a GBC, this the, the PDF of the generation interval divided by the sum of the PDFs, GAC and GBC. So probably the A is the infector is GAC divided by this sum, and probably the B is the infector is GBC divided by that sum. And nicely, the probabilities add to one. So we've got that going for us, which is nice, as Bill Murray would say. So as before, uh, with the pairwise survival, we, we can also take likelihood ratios, but now we get hazard functions, ratios of hazard functions. So HAC divided by the sum of the hazards, probably the B is the infector is H of BC divided by the sum of the hazards. Again, we get the, the probabilities adding up to one. However, in the branching process likelihood, um, we get the, the generation interval at, you know, at the beginning of the epidemic, which is okay here because we don't have a bunch of extra sources of, of infection. The, the PDF is proportional to e to the minus beta t. So since there's a longer time between the infection of C and A than there is between the infections of C and B. So e to the minus TC minus TA is gonna be smaller than e to the minus TC minus TB. So according to the branches, branching process likelihood, B is more likely than A to be the infector of C, but that's not correct. And the pairwise survival likelihood gets things right. Both of them have probability one half of being the infector. So, so we get correct source attribution with the pairwise survival likelihood and incorrect source attribution with the, the generation interval distribution. And there, there's no way to correct this problem with the, the branching processes. So the other thing to know about source attribution is that it's not always useful. So um, in the exponential contact interval model from the last slide, the likelihood for each of the transmission trees is beta squared e to the minus beta capital T, where this capital T is just the sum of the times, the pair time spent at risk of transmission. The overall likelihood is the sum, so that's just two beta squared e to the minus beta T, but with or without the transmission tree, we get the same point estimate and interval estimate for, for beta. So, in these exponential models, the, it often turns out that the, um, the transmission tree is an, is an ancillary statistic. So in order to have the transmission tree be informative, we need non-exponential contact intervals, or we need some variation in infectiousness and susceptibility between individuals. Can you give some intuition about why that might be true? Well, in, in, in an ex, like if, if I have a homogeneous model and, and exponential contact intervals, all transmission trees are equally likely. So there, there's no, and when all of the transmission trees are equally likely, they, you know, they don't, 
you know, I, I'm basically just taking my my overall likelihood and dividing it by a fixed number. So the and and so we, we don't get any extra information about the, the parameters governing transmission when we add in the, the transmission tree. So I, I have seen some papers about source attribution where they, they make this a homogeneity assumption and an exponential assumption. And, and it, it just turns out that, that when you have those two assumptions, the transmission tree is, is not, does, does not add anything useful to our understanding of transmission. I think I must be missing something because I mean, I mean, once you have the transmission tree, if you assume it's correct, then it's no longer a uniform attribution model, right? You know. Well, so in in the, in this example, and because we have homogeneity and exponential contact intervals, it, with either of the transmission, so we had these, um, so we have these two possible transmission trees, right? So the the likelihood for each of those trees is beta squared e to the minus beta t. If I, if I don't see which one, if I just see the, the epidemiologic information that was a few slides above that, then my likelihood is two times beta squared. So it's just two times what the likelihood would have been had I seen the transmission tree. I see. So once once I take, you know, take the get the score equation and the information function, I get exactly the same point estimate and interval estimate for for beta hat hmm. or for the, the rate. That, you know, for the hazard of, of transmission. The, the, in, the transmission tree just is not informative. Okay. So if I violate either of those, if I have non-exponential contact intervals, so somebody's infectiousness varies over time, or, or if I have you know, differential infectiousness or differential susceptibility, then that's not true anymore. Then, then, the, then it's useful to have uh, a, an observed transmission tree or partial information about the transmission tree. Thank you. So, but I, but it, it just, it is possible for this to not be informative, which is kind of entertaining. So, um, so you, using, so I, despite the title of the talk, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the uh, the survival, you know, the sort of pairwise survival analysis. But you, we can ex, we can. Uh, generalize um, parametric methods, non-parametric methods, accelerated failure times methods, and semi-parametric regression um, from standard survival analysis to the analysis of transmission. And, and the game plan in all of that is that you show that when you see who infected whom, everything reduces to a standard survival analysis problem where we have failure times and ordered pairs of individuals rather than individuals. And then you figure out some way to handle the problem when you don't see who infected whom, because typically we do not see that. So in, in uh, parametric methods, it involves adding up likelihood contributions from the different transmission trees, which we can do using a, a sum product factorization. So even though the number of transmission trees is typically very large, it can be calculated very easily. Uh, in in uh, non-parametric or semi-parametric applications, we use an EM algorithm to iteratively reweight the different transmission trees. But again, there, there, in it, there's, we can sort of do that independently for different infected people, which makes the process very quick, even when the number of transmission trees is very large. So these, these methods are implemented in a, in a package for R called Transstat, which is available on, on GitHub. So I'd be very happy um, to see people using that and sending me questions and, and problems and new things they would like to see in that package. OK. so. Uh, in simulation studies, I had I had a um, figure on here that was very very large, so I, I I took it off. But it turns out that knowing who infected whom is equivalent to about a twenty to forty percent sample size increase for infectious infectiousness covariate effect and pairwise covariate. So pairwise covariates would be like membership in the same household or something like that. It doesn't boil down to to a characteristic of one individual or the other. So for based on hazard estimates, we got a 10 to 20% sample size increase. For susceptibility effects, it's very interesting. Um, you know, when you already know who is infected, it, it doesn't help you that much more to know who infected whom. So, but, so we get the uh, phylogenies or partial information about who infected whom increase our, you know, increase our precision for infectiousness and pairwise covariate effects, not for susceptibility covariate effects. It also helps for, for baseline hazards or survival functions. So it's good to see who infected whom. How do we get that from, from a phylogeny? So that, that's a very um, 
it's an important question. It's also a very complicated question. And, and I've, I've dealt with it in the same way that I, I think several, in a way that's similar to the way that several other people have done it. But first, um, I want to say what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about the large scale spatiotemporal spread of disease. So, you know, the, the base phylogeography, um, you know, effective population sizes, or, um, you know, fitting compartmental models to sort of population level data. Um, I, I think there's a lot of reason to believe that, that those are, are useful things to do. Um, but I'm more interested in using densely sampled genetic data to look at transmission in settings like, like households. So I, I don't want, to, I, I'm just not talking about this. I, I, I think this is really, really interesting work and, and it's been useful in the current epidemic and it will continue to be useful. When we move down to small time scales, uh, we, we have sev several assumptions that are workable at large scales break down. So we can assume that the coalescent times in the phylogeny approximate transmission times. When we have uh, within host evolution, there can be important differences in these times. Um, and then the uh, phylogenetic trees and the transmission trees are not necessarily the same. So that this is a uh, an example by uh, Oliver Pybus and Andrew Rambeau, where, where they show, you know, at, at the top we have the patients and we have the evolution of the virus, the, the phylogenies within the patients and they're connected to the transmission tree and the transmission tree and the virus tree have a very different structure. So some methods that, you know, so, and if we have a single strain, like a single dominant strain in an individual, and that's the one that's always transmitted, then, then you can argue that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the, the pathogen phylogeny and the transmission tree. But when you don't have that, they, they can have a different structure. And if we select an optimal transmission tree based on the phylogeny, so there, there are some methods that, that use a phylogeny to select a transmission tree. If we pick only one transmission tree based on the phylogeny, we, we're, we might be overestimating the amount of information that we have. So here's, here's a, you know, we have two possible transmission trees from the household example we talked about before. But there are three possible um, phylogenetic trees. And a very important thing that's going on is what's happening at the interior nodes of the phylogeny. So th these are these are things we observe, and these are things that we're reconstructing. And these are viruses, so they had to live, you know, they're, they're pathogens, they had to live in a host. So we know who the hosts were of the people at the leaves of the tree, but we don't necessarily know who the host was at the, at the interior node. So here we have uh, person A, now, C can't be the host here because then we'd have to have a host living, you know, virus living in A, then living in C and back to A, which is not possible. So A has to be the host here. In this phylogeny, we also have A was infected before B, so A has to be the host here. So with these two phylogenies, we know exactly who the host had to be at the interior nodes, and that actually tells us who infected whom. So we had A infect C and A infect B. And over here, we have A infect C and A infect B. So these two phylogenies are consistent only with this transmission tree. Over here, it's possible that A was the host here, or it's possible that B was the host here. And depending on who the host was, we get two different transmission trees. If A was the host, we get, we get this tree over here, because A infected B and A infected C. So we have a virus living in A here, and it's got a descendant that shows up in B, and then a descendant that shows up in C, with no intermediate hosts. And uh, no intermediate people hosting the the virus. If B is the host here, then we have A infecting B and B infecting C. So that's consistent with this transmission tree. So sometimes observing the phylogeny will 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 tell us exactly which transmission tree was right, and and sometimes it won't. So these two will tell us which transmission tree occurred, and and this one will not. So this is a really really simple example. So the the uh, the key problem is how to extend this type of reasoning to, to more complicated um, phylogenies. So we, uh, in a paper I did with uh, Betts Halloran, uh, Tom Britton and Ireland Genie, we derived an algorithm to enumerate the transmission trees consistent with a pathogen phylogeny and with a set of epidemiologic data. Mm -hmm. 
The algorithm requires two traversals of the phylogeny. One goes from the tips to the root, and then you go from the root back to the, the tips. And once you've done both, you know exactly who the possible hosts are at the interior nodes, and you can enumerate the possible transmission trees. So we assume complete sample, we, and we have assumptions. So we, we have complete sampling of cases. We do allow for more than one sample per person, and we have a strict transmission bottleneck. So we assume that, that there's only one lineage that gets transmitted at any one time. So, you know, in a, in a more general formulation of the problem, the, the transmission tree is like a species tree, and the pathogen phylogeny is like a gene tree. So, you, you know, you can have, you know, you can have, I forget, I forget the name for it, but you can have um, multiple lineages passing through, through a species. So this, this would be like having two viruses in an individual that, that didn't coalesce in the person who infected them. They, they coalesced in, in an ancestor of the person who in, infected them. So we, we uh, remove that possibility by assuming that only one lineage is transmitted at, at any time. And the relationship between the phylogenies and the transmission trees is, is the same as, as other people have used. So uh, Rolf Ipma et al. in a paper in genetics in 2013, Xavier Didelo et al. and um, Paul and Rambeau, they, they, also, um, they also use the same relation. So, so basically, the, the overall pathogen phylogeny is just assembled from the within host phylogenies. So, the difference between what we did and what these these other researchers did is is that we actually um, attempted to enumerate all of the transmission trees. Um, whereas I, you know, I think in in these other cases they would enforce this relationship in in an MCMC algorithm. And 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 I think it's honestly an open question whether it, being able to enumerate all of the transmission trees is is useful because I I think. Um, you know, it, it might be the case that the MCMC algorithms these other people were using are, are just as, as efficient. But it's an interesting theoretical problem to, to try to enumerate all of the transmission trees. So our assumptions, so we didn't want to make assumptions about the relationship between the phylogenies and the transmission trees. We wanted to make assumptions about biology that then allowed us to infer a relationship between the phylogeny and the transmission trees. So each individual is affected at most once. The order in which infections occurred is known. So we don't necessarily need the time, but we need to know the order in which they happened. Um, each infection is initiated by a single pathogen. And really, a single lineage is, is OK. Um, following infection, pathogen evolution takes place within the host, and then these evolved pathogens are passed on to other people. We have at least one pathogen sequence from each infected person. So these first three assumptions are sort of about biology. Um, now, down here, we start to get into assumptions about study design. This is where we, where we explicit, you know, specify what we mean by dense sampling. We have at least one from each infected person. Each pathogen in the phylogeny had a host, and parent-child relationships between pathogens with different hosts represent direct transmissions of infection from the host of the parent to the host of the child. So we, we were using that up here. So I was saying if you know, it, since A is A is here, A infected C. B did not infect C. You know, since A is here, A infected B. C did not infect B, and so on. So those are the assumptions. And then from those assumptions, you can say that the nodes infected by each infected, the nodes hosted by each infected individual are a subtree of the overall phylogeny. And that subtree represents pathogen evolution within the host. So the overall phylogeny is sort of you know, a pasting together of within individual phylogenies. And then a phylogeny with known interior hosts implies a unique transmission tree. So this reduces the problem of enumerating the transmission trees to the problem of figuring out who are the possible hosts at the interior nodes. So the subtree hosted by any individual I has a root RI. If RI is the root of the phylogeny, then I was infected from outside the population. Otherwise, RI has a parent whose host infected I. So it, it's possible to have multiple people infected from outside the population. And, th and then you imagine that this sort of common external source is at the root of the, of the tree. So here's an example. We have a, a foot and mouth disease virus outbreak in 12 farms in Durham, UK in 2001. So this is, this is just sort of the... Um, where the farms are located. So they're, they're A through L. So they skipped A because there's an M and there's an O. So each, each one is identified with a number, a letter. And then um, this is the timing. So this is the, 
the gray is the range of possible latent periods and I is the assumed infectious period. If you go through all possibilities, we have 19,440 possible transmission trees consistent with the epidemiologic data if we allow latent periods to go from two to 16 days. So what we want to use is use the phylogeny to reduce the number of possible transmission trees. So and here's, here's the phylogenies. I just took this phylogeny as given. So here's, here's just a redrawing of it with the, the labels of the, the farms and then the onset of infectiousness in the farms. So the first thing we have to do is, is find the, the first host. So in each, in each clade, I have somebody who's infected before everybody else was. So, so down here, D was infected before M. So out of, out of these hosts at the leaves, D is the only possible infector here. Out, out of these three, P, D, and M, P got infected first. So out of these three, P is the only possible host here. It doesn't mean that P is actually a possible host. It might turn out that P couldn't be a host there, but out of those three, P is the only one. And in other words, D and M are definitely not hosts up here. P, D, and M are not hosts up here because C is the only one. So that's what we call the first host. So here, now we have the, the phylogeny labeled with the first host. So if we know, because we know the order in which the infections happen, we, we can assign the first host within each clade. So for any node, so now we get to different interior node hosts imply different transmission trees. So for any node X in the phylogeny, the host either, the host is, is the first host so this is an interior node. So it's it's the host is either the first host or the host has to be the person who, the individual who infected the first host. So up here, the host here is either P or the person who infected P. The host here is either C or the person who infected C. So and any given transmission tree corresponds to at most one possible assignment of interior node hosts in a phylogeny. So combined with the earlier results, we get a one-to-one -one relationship between the possible transmission trees and the possible assignment of interior node hosts in the phylogeny. So now we do the traversals of the, uh, of the tree. So if X is an interior node host, then host X equals first X or the host of the parent of X. So the intuition there is to get to here, anybody who ha who got to here has to come down. You know, they have to, it's to. Each person hosts a subtree of the overall phylogeny. So um, I could get P be a host here and host a subtree. If P is not a host here, whoever is a host here has to has to host a subtree that includes this node. So they sort of had to come down through the tree to reach these nodes. And down, I, when I say down, I mean down from the root to the tips. So that they had to come this way to get to that node. Okay, so if X is an interior node, an interior node with child Y in the phylogeny, then our host is the the set of nodes, the within the within clade set of hosts, or the infectious set of Y, that should say, yeah, so this is the infectious set of Y. So this, these are the, the set of people who could infect that first host, or it's the set of, of possible hosts from outside of the clade. So DX is, the, so this is, I, I, I always have trouble presenting this because partly I get confused. And it, it might, uh, I might just point out that we're sort of moving along in time. Uh, and oh, okay. It might be time to sort of like skip over a few of the details and. Sure. Um, okay, so anyway, we, ha we have what we call post-order hosts. The post-order host sets can be calculated in a, in a recursive algorithm going up the tree from, or from the leaves up to the root. And then, so these are the set of post-order hosts. So you know, and these are the infectious sets. So P is a possible host, L, O, and C are possible hosts. These are the infectious sets of each 
person. And then we come down to, so we have de you know, descendant constraints and then central, ancestral constraints. And both of these can be chewed through in a single traversal of the tree. So at the end, we get the possible host sets. Um, and then those host sets turn out to be, to correspond to only four possible transmission trees. So using the phylogeny, we've gone from 19,440 transmission trees to four possible transmission trees. And this, this map shows who infected whom. So we get infectors of E and P are not certain. So E could be infected either by K or L, and P could be infected by either O or C. So here is where E is, and here is K or L, and here is C, and here is O and C as possible infectors of P. Okay, so the likelihood calculation when we have genetic sequence data is, is a weighted sum of the, uh, the probabilities of the phylogenies and the, the possible transmission trees. So this, this term depends on within host pathogen evolution. Unfortunately, this weighted sum seems to be intractable to any sort of factorization or, or any sort of pruning algorithm or anything like that. But this unweighted sum can be calculated using a pruning algorithm. So in our example, we'll just show how this works. So we have the like, we know that the host at N1 is A, so we have a likelihood at N1 given that A is the host. That breaks down into two terms. You have a likelihood at N3 given that A is the host, and then we have a likelihood at N2. It could have A as a host, or we have to have transmission from A to B, and then B is the host. And then, each of these terms can be broken down into further terms. So we get, um, you know, HAB given that N4, B is the host at N4, HAC given that C is the host at N5, and so on and so on. And when, it, when we get to a term like this, we know that B is the host at N4, so we're done. So we get an HAB, SAB, HAC, SAC, HA, so this is the same likelihood we, we uh, calculated before because this was the this is the uh, transmission tree that's that's consistent with both of the possible transmission trees so we get the likelihood that's the sum of the two transmission trees this is not the actual likelihood because the the two transmission trees they're not weighted by uh, by a term that would depend on the within host evolution of the pathogen so there we go. so there we're back to the same likelihood we had before so it almost works. So, you know, I did a thousand epidemic simulations on a Watch, Watch Strogatz network with a Weibull contact interval distribution. And I used data from the first thousand infections. And then we have epidemiologic data on with who infected whom, epidata only, and epidata in a phylogenetic tree. Everything is fine with the epidata only and the epidata and who infected whom. But when I use this unweighted likelihood for the phylogenetic tree, I get a small bias. The application I think this has is that you could run an MCMC algorithm with the approximate likelihood, which would go very, very quickly, and then you could come back and importance weight a thinned uh, posterior sample. So you'd, you'd, you'd only have to calculate the full likelihood, which would be much more intensive, a very small number of times compared to the, the total number of MCMC samples. So to look at the potential value of a phylogeny, we did um, this is this, the series of simulations shown at the beginning. Uh, 1,000 simulations, 100 independent households. We had infectiousness and susceptibility parameters and the baseline hazard. The uh, beta infant, beta sus were chosen from a uniform negative one to one distribution. And then we used data from the first 200 infections to estimate these, these coefficients and the baseline hazard. We have epidemiologic data, epidemiologic data and in who infected whom, and epidemiologic data and within household phylogenies. And then um, for infectiousness and baseline hazard, we can see knowing the phylogeny gets us most of the way to seeing who infected whom. Same thing with the, the baseline hazard. All analyses were equally efficient for beta sus. So the, the phylogeny, if we want to know just effects on susceptibility, it's, it's not as useful. So in here's um, statistical performance of estimators, uh, coverage probabilities, all near 0.95, relative efficiencies that increase as we know more about who infected whom. So we talked about right truncated data. So now let's see what happens when we don't see the people who did not get infected and everything goes to hell. 
my favorites are the ones down here for the baseline has, you know, we, we actually, it, it's not a complete disaster with uh, the infectiousness and susceptibility coefficients, it's bad, but um, it's really a, a total washout with the baseline hazard. Here is zero coverage probabilities out of a thousand simulations. So this data on, you know, this the epidemiologic study design, um, getting data on people who were at risk of the event but did not have it is very, very important. So here's, here's our reconstruction of the transmission trees from 2001. We also had a 2007 FMDV outbreak. Um, this, is, this is sort of our estimate of infectiousness. So this is our, our point estimate. And then we have confidence intervals. Without the phylogeny, we get much wider confidence intervals than we get with the phylogeny. And the infectiousness has a slightly different shape. However, there were approximately 200 uninfected farms in each area that were left out of the data. So these estimates are are unconnected to reality. We would need data on those those 200 farms. I did a sensitivity analysis where I thought, how many uninfected farms could there be? And I had like 12 and 24 and stuff like that. But it, but um, uh, it actually turns out there's much a much larger number of farms than than I thought was was possible. So transmission likelihoods and epidemiologic study design have an important role to play in infectious disease epidemiology with or without phylogenetics. Um, pairwise survival analysis gives us a, a, a robust framework for epidemiologic and statistical methods in infectious disease epidemiology. For many questions about the epidemiology of emerging infections, high resolution studies of transmission in well-defined populations at risk will be more informative than population level data. Um, this, this is a point that I think is very important in the, in the COVID-19 epidemic because there has been no and there, there's been very little contact tracing or household or hospital or cruise ship data that has been both collected and, and made available. So all, all of the data that is accessible to me is population level line list data. And I think it's, it's very, you know, it, it, it doesn't give us uh, as strong a basis for understanding your know, timing of transmission relative to symptoms or what the infectiousness profile looks like or, or even what R0 is than we would have from these, these more detailed studies. The, the data from the cruise ships has been particularly painful because there was clearly a lot of transmission on those cruise ships. There was an ability to collect that data. The data might or might not have been collected. The Japanese government released a, um, a very nice descriptive summary of that data but the, the, the actual sort of you know, data that you could turn into pairwise data and run these types of analyses on is not available anywhere, to my knowledge. And, and we, there are definitely things we could know about transmission that we should know by now, but don't know now because we have not collected the right types of data. So phylogenetics will be a very valuable tool for improving precision and reducing bias and estimates of transmission tra parameters but bad epidemiologic study design cannot be corrected by genetics or by any type of analysis. It's, it's garbage in, garbage out. And, and that includes when we have um, genetic sequence data from these, these pathogens. So it, it can shield it and it, it can make the analyses better even when we have bad design, but it, it can't completely correct the problem. And we really need to get better at, at collecting sort of contact tracing data, household data, um, data from hospitals that aren't just lineless, and, and data from other situations where there's, there's transmission, because there's overwhelming evidence that that has gone on with COVID-19. So um, I've been supported by, by these grants. Um, everything in here is my fault, not the fault of the NIH or any of my, my co-authors or any of the people I cite. So, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, thank you very much for, uh, for tuning in and, and thanks to Eric for inviting me to, uh, to give a talk today. Great, thank you very much. And thanks to Carolyn. Um, yes, thank you, Carolyn. So can you just, I mean, so I, I'm not in this field. Can you say a little bit more about exactly what the sort of data you would like? I mean, I'm not familiar with the term line list. Uh, I mean, I can understand contact tracing, but what form does that actually take? Right. So <clears throat> I know a, a line list is just, here's this person who was infected and, and possibly when and where, um, you know, maybe when they had symptom onsets, maybe when they, they had a clinical, so, so you have data on each infected 
person that they couldn't you know the person place and time data but you you do not have the line lists do not have people who you know this you, you don't get this person was at risk of infection but as of this time has not been infected you, you don't get that in a in a line list you only get infected people and um, contact tracing data. Contact tracing data can can recover data on on people who are exposed to infection but not infected. But often they throw out data when people were not infected. So I, I've I've seen situations where they did contact tracing. They identified people who were not infected and then then got rid of that data. So. Um, you know, I think con contact tracing is being done. I, I, I assume that there are people who are looking at data from the hospitals and, and households, but I, I f it's not, the, you know, the data available to, to me is, is lineless and epidemic curves and, and things like that. And most of the modeling and analysis I've seen is, is based on that type of data. And uh, I, I've been in contact with a lot of people asking for this type of data and, and so far have found None, but but you know, sort of household surveillance and um, you know, and hospital. Like, there's been a lot. There's a lot of evidence of transmission in hospitals, um, the cruise ships. So there, there's there's been a number of opportunities to learn about transmission in these settings with a clearly defined population at at risk. But I don't think that we've taken full advantage of them yet. Right. Yeah, and that that would. So, I mean, that would lead to those sort of contact intervals, like you say, that are really important for understanding the denominator. Well, I, yeah, I, and I think part of it is that the, um, I know I was actually reading, you know, the, the secondary attack rate dates back to the very early 20th century. And I was reading a, a paper by Wade Hampton Frost the other day, and he was talking about how, you know, he didn't invent that concept, but he was saying, talking about how useful it was and, and yet how disorganized our our knowledge of, the transmission of disease within households was, and he this was in the late 30s, I think 1938, when he wrote this paper, and and he was saying, you know, it's because the the data either isn't collected or it's or it's not put into sort of a standard form where where it can be analyzed and and compared, and I think we really have that we still have that same problem, and you know there there are you know I think there are people who recognize the importance of this this type of data, but it, it's often not put into a, a a format, or, or we use methods of analysis that, that can't really be compared. And I think the um, I think you know the pairwise survival framework is is a nice framework for for handling this this type of data. Um, you know, it, it, the chain by it turns out if you take these pairwise survival likelihoods and you discretize time, you can get out the chain binomial models from it. So so they really form a continuum. That it includes discrete time models and and continuous time models and uh, and the other unfortunate thing is a lot of time even when this data is collected it's often analyzed with a binomial model and binomial models um, do not estimate uh, secondary attack rates accurately um, you you can identify uh, the final attack rate in the household accurately if you adjust for clustering of cases within households but if you then turn around and interpret what you get out of the binomial model as a transmission probability, you're not getting an accurate picture of, of transmission. So I think it's both, you know, the, we still don't have the intersection of data collection and analytical methods to take full advantage of, of this, this type of data. So that's, you know, by making this transat package, I'm, I'm hoping to address the, the data analysis side of things. But as I, you know, right now I'm, I'm sitting here, I can whine as much as I want but this type of data just is not being um, made available, e even if it is being collected. So, um, yeah, you know, that that's that's a that's something we need to do better in in future epidemics, which unfortunately so, there will be. Yeah. Um, so just two. We should wrap up pretty soon. But two quick questions. Well, maybe Carolyn's isn't so quick. Uh, she just wanted you to make things a little bit more concrete with an example. So her example is let's say you had negative. A thousand negative tests of contacts who were potentially exposed, and say twenty cases of whom ten were introductions and ten were not. Can you be, make that a little bit more concrete? So, um, so two two thousand so two thousand tests. A thousand tests, twenty a positive, thousand. ten were introductions and ten were sort of community transmission. <clears throat> okay, so. 
and, and the interpretation of that data would depend a lot on on how people were grouped. So those those ten positive tests were those like, you know, how many households were they d divided among? So we we need, you know, we need right. not just not just the the outcome data for each person, but you also you also need something about how they were connected to each other. Because if if those if those ten people were infected or in ten different households, that that would lead us to a different conclusion than if we had. Um, you know, a household of size five that had four people infected, and then you know, two households of size four that each had three people in infected. So, um, but you know, I think they often collect that type of data when they do contact tracing. It, it's just it, it doesn't end up getting organized in a way that's useful for for doing a, a chain binomial model or a, or a pairwise survival model. Um, I I hope that answers Carolyn's question. It probably doesn't. Fully. I mean, I, I, I think it does underline the complexity of like the type of data. Um, so just this is more of a clarification question, but why Sir Rahman wanted to ask uh, what sort of network data do you ignore or at the very which school contact data or who infected whom? I think this is back at the beginning where you're saying if you ignore that network data, how the efficiency changes. Right. So in the in the simulations I showed, I, I would just I knew you know when I identified an infection, we could see their neighbors, and then you know we'd see whether their neighbors got infected or not. So th it's a little bit like contact tracing. And in, in in real life, I, I think the the type of contact tracing data, you know, the the type of data we would want is is you know who lives in the household, or you know during this hospital outbreak, you know who was on this floor, when were they on this floor. What what was the infection outcome? Um, you know, on the who was on the cruise ship? When did they get infected? Uh, or when you know how how long did we swab swab them without detecting infection? Um, things like that. So I, I think often it you know or within the cruise ship who is in the same room and who is in different rooms or you know there's a there's a, a vaccine study from from Senegal I was talking about with somebody and they have compounds and so it would be useful to know who's in the compound if, if you knew. This this is a respiratory infection they were talking about. So if you knew who slept in the same building, that would be that would be useful. But um, and there's there's clearly um, you know almost a whole anthropology of how would you collect um, useful useful contact data. But but I, I think as an as an improvement over what's done now, even even something like you know when you go to a household, how many people are there? How many people were not infected? Because you know, I, in in some cases, they'll go to a household and and only retain information on on people who got infected. So you you just blew a chance to 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 take right. account of the person time that people spent at risk, you know, at risk of infection, but not not infected. So I, I think there's very simple things that would be an improvement on current practice. But you know, in an ideal world, um, what sort of contact trace, you know, what sort of data would you need on people's relationships could be very Complex, so, you know, because you could, you know, okay, you have households. What about people in the schools? And you know, what about you? Ha you have these overlapping groups of contacts that that could um, complicate study design. And, and that's where, like, a, a method that could identify which infections happen from outside the household. You know, if genetics can do that, that would be a huge contribution because then then you could just model transmission within the household without having to worry about transmission in these other overlapping groups of contacts. But, but you'd have to be able to identify reliably which infections occurred within the household and which ones were caused by sources outside the household. And, and I, I think that might actually be one of the most useful applications of phylogenetics in infectious disease epidemiology, is just identifying that. Yeah. All right, well, we are well over time, uh, so we'll wrap up. And that concludes our series of three talks. Thank you very much. Um, that was interesting and surprisingly pertinent. Uh, we, I did not know what was coming down the pipe when I scheduled these talks. <laughs> anyway, uh, the next uh, series of trees will be on uh, of talks will be on tree sequences. Uh, at see, at least for now. Uh, I'm forward to having that. Bye, everyone. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat>